to get some dog ambiance. The dog course. Well, we're vaccinated at least. Yep, we are. We got round two. My Bill Gates microchip is coming in loud and clear. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I've received the instructions from the... Is The Illuminati's not doing anything anymore, are they? I don't think so. It's moved on from that. I, I stopped no, getting just, the newsletter. It's just a cabal. <laughs> well, that's why they're sending the dogs is because I, I didn't get the microchip version, so they, they have to come back for me. Oh, okay. There you go. <laughs> Got in the wrong line. Yeah. It's my, my bad. <laughs> All right. What are we doing today? Uh, today we're going to read some theory. Oh. Yeah. Well, I already read it, actually. Yeah, we're we have both it. read it. We're going to talk about some <laughs> theory. We're going to talk about the state and revolution. By Vladimir Lenin. You wouldn't want to listen to a recording us of us reading it because one, that would be boring, and two, you'd realize how often I just give up and check Twitter for an hour and come back. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a ten hour long audiobook, <laughs> even though it probably only takes like I think there are recordings of it they're like three hours or something. <laughs> it would just be me sighing. <laughs> All right, yeah, so The State and Revolution by Vladimir Lenin. Uh, written in 1917. Okay. And I think he publishes it after they've already like taken power. Like this was written beforehand. Okay. Uh, he was like in hiding at the time from the <laughs> provisional government because he was anti-government, you know? Mm -hmm. And so he was hiding in Finland and he like leaves those notes behind when he comes back to Russia when, when, when everything starts going down. And mm -hmm. then like he sends somebody after it later. He's like, please, I left my blue notebook there. If <laughs> I'm knocked off beforehand, please uh, go get that and publish it. Jeez. Uh, so yeah, that's what we're, that's Intense. what we've read. Dude should have gotten a Dropbox. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, have you ever heard of Google drive? Uh, Come on. All right. Cool. Well, do you want to just get into it? Let's get into it. If you start up top at the preface. We talk about, like, basically, what's the book about? All right, you know? well, I'm going to tell you I didn't read the preface because I'm a shithead. So, what's the uh, preface? All it does is just tell you, okay, well, this is about the question, the relationship <laughs> between the revolution of the people, right, and uh -huh. the state. Uh-huh. Uh, Lenin says it's about to be a huge deal. He wants to make sure people know what's up, make sure people don't have the wrong ideas, the wrong arguments, make sure people know what they're doing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Basically, make sure people see it his way. Yeah, okay. Cool. All right, so we start then with chapter one. Class, society, and the state. Yeah, and this is conveniently broken down into pretty short sections. I liked that. Yeah, I'm, I'm bitching, but it was actually pretty readable. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just, just about, lazy. Just about the time you're like, oh my, when is the next thing coming? Like, it was... It was on the next page, so mm -hmm. it was fairly short. Listeners, if you want to follow along, you can either go to Marxist.org and get this whole PDF for free, or if you want to throw some cash our way, you can go to patreon.com slash teachmecommunism, um, and for $5, you'll get access to our notes, and you will you can get mine, which is beautifully marked up with yeah. lots of LOLs and questions. Yes. So, yeah. They're great notes <laughs> from a great co-host. Thank you. Chapter one, class society and the state. Mm -hmm. What do you've got for this? All right. Uh, I broke it into sections like he did. I used his sections. Mm -hmm. So the first section is the state, a product of the an irreconcilability of class antagonisms. My summary for the people. Yes, let's do that. Listeners, if you haven't heard me do this, uh, I think I did this for Open Veins was the mm -hmm. first one. That's when I got the name for it. This is These are my summaries because I don't have time to read this again. So... <laughs> This is so I remember what it says. Basically, this is where he's throwing down. This is the first track of the diss album. He's like, people are getting Marx wrong. Mm -hmm. These motherfuckers, Kotsky and Plenkinov, these guys fucking suck. And I'm going to tell you how to do it right. That's yeah. basically it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He, yeah, he basically says people are really out there, you know, distorting Marx and Engels, deviating away from the true religion, the true mm -hmm. way, you know, and he knows what Marx was really he's, saying, he's what Engels was really saying. So, yeah, he's here to set the record straight. I did like how he admitted that, like, this was going to be boring. <laughs> At one point, he's like, yeah, well, to be like accurate, I'm going to be quoting them a lot, which I realize is going to make this like not popular. And I was like, right. I mean, at least you admit it. It is one of his most well, well read, like uh, oh, okay. widely read texts. So, so he was just being humble. Yeah. All right. This is where we get a, a quote that we've talked about on this show before when we were doing Lenin's okay. biography. 
Yeah, we already have talked about Lennon in episode 34, who was Vladimir Lennon. So if you want to go listen to that for a little preview. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the the quote we've we've talked about before when he's saying, like, people are getting away from Marx and Engels. Mm-hmm. Uh, he says, what's happening now to Marxist theory has, in the course of history, happened repeatedly to the theories of revolutionary thinkers and leaders of oppressed classes fighting for emancipation. During the lifetime of great revolutionaries, the oppressing classes constantly hounded them, receiving their theories with the most savage malice, the most furious hatred, and the most unscrupulous campaign of lies and slanders. Very true. Yeah. Uh, After their death, attempts are made to convert them into harmless icons, to (laughs) canonize them, so to say, and to hallow their names to a certain extent for the consolation of the oppressed classes and with the object of duping the latter, while at the same time robbing the revolutionary theory of its substance, blunting its revolutionary edge, and vulgarizing it. Damn. Yeah. So, um, you know, he's saying, like, people are turning Marx and Engels into, like, just very, uh, from our American point of view, very liberal Democrats, you know? Yeah, which I think is really funny because, like, how do you do that? Like, you really fucked up somewhere. <laughs> yeah, and that's what he spends the whole time talking about is, like, we are going to quote at length and see what they really said. Mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. almost, in a way, like a Bible study, but of Marx and Engels, <laughs> all right? You imagine Lenin is here, like, because he, he's pulling passages from all of their writings, their letters. Yeah. He's really synthesizing it all together. And giving you this coherent message. And I don't know. I would say that this that he probably engages in some like, oh, this part fits, this part doesn't. I mean, it makes sense for him to do that. Yeah, I think so. But uh, but he makes an internally kind of consistent yes. claim. Yeah. And I mean, we've talked about this quote before. And the reason it's so good is because it absolutely is happening and has mm-hmm. happened. Like, if you look at how, you know, really radical civil rights leaders are now treated, just kind of repackaging these these leftists and selling them back to us as like, not that big of a deal. Yeah. Even now I saw <laughs> there's this horrible tweet from DSA about how like, we're the real uh, socialists. And it was just like, so fucking weak. It was just like, <laughs> what is your problem? Like, it was, it was something like, you know, we're trying to model ourselves after like Nordic countries and we know it's not like real communism or real socialism, but it's good enough. And I was like, what the fuck? Like, Dude, Lenin was, would have hated it that. It was some weak sauce. Dang. Lenin would totally be anti-DSA, by the way. Oh, absolutely. He's anti most people that aren't <laughs> him, uh, as we'll see. Yeah, man. Right. So he's going to set the record straight. Shall we get into that? Yeah, I wanted to ask about... So he starts right away calling people shit out in this first section. Ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So who's this Kotsky guy? Because he fucking hates him. Carl Kotsky. Yeah. All right, you want to see Carl Kotsky? You know I do. <laughs> Got a nice little round beard. He looks like a creep. He looks like a knockoff Sigmund Freud I was me. thinking Freud, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, Carl Kotsky... Interesting thing about this, because he's very venomous toward Kotsky, right? Yeah, he, he fucking hates him. He hates this dude. But here's the thing about Kotsky. In his early years, he was friends with Frederick Engels. Mm. A personal friends. Uh, Engels put him to the task of editing Marx's theory of surplus value. Uh, I mean, like, he's like an OG Marxist, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he was in the German Social Democratic Party. He was... By all accounts, I didn't do an exa- uh, exhaustive biography of him or anything, yeah, yeah. but uh, he was kind of like in there with, like I said, with Engels, like... Yeah, he was in it. Uh, but when it came down to it, like he was, from the Wikipedia page anyways, he was like good on the on the war question for World War One instead of like backing the chauvinists That's who went good. along with it. He like left the party. Uh, but he ends up coming back afterward, uh, and then he was like anti-Bolshevik once the whole revolution went down. He oh. said uh, the Bolsheviks under Lenin's leadership succeeded in capturing control of the armed forces. Blah blah blah. Founded founded a new dictatorship in place of the old Tsarist dictatorship. Whoops. So okay. he was really you yeah. know considers the people that he talks about here considering himself anti-authoritarian. That mm-hmm. was definitely. That was definitely Kotsky. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why, because he feels stabbed in the back, that he mm. kind of calls him a renegade all the time. Betrayal. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, Lenin jumps in saying, what did Marx and Engels really say about the state? And he mm-hmm. starts with this quote from Engels, where it kind of lays it out, you know, the, saying that the state 
is a product of society at a certain stage of development. It's an omission that this society has become entangled in an insoluble contradiction with itself. It's got irreconcilable antagonisms between classes. Mm -hmm. And that, not to reconcile, but to solve the, to keep in check the class antagonisms, the state arises from that, like, above society. Let's kind of translate that. Okay. I would say, my, my translation of that is, to have a state, you have to elevate something to be above the people. So, like, they have to be able to enforce laws. Mm -hmm. And under capitalism, most of those laws are going to be focused on capital, such yeah. as property, marriage, inheritance, taxes, uh, regulating people and businesses and things like that. So, yeah. like, the majority of our laws are based off of that. Yes, yeah. So I mean, like, you got, like, yeah, don't murder people kind of laws. But you have a, a surprising amount of law is, you know, yeah. real estate law. Uh-huh. So the state is fundamentally, like, not accountable to people. Like, that's a characteristic of it. It's mm -hmm. above the people. So mm -hmm. you can't, like influence it directly. And we'll spend some time talking about that yes. later. Uh, but the state arises and he talks about that it's not just a capitalist thing, whether you're in feudalism or old slave societies, you would have this too, the state being there to crush the opposition class. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like back in feudal times, the law was like, you got to give a tenth of your grain or whatever. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's definitely, the state will be influenced by whatever system you have in place at the time yes yeah and it is uh lenin points out a couple of different ways that people try to twist this around which he says is wrong yeah uh, he says some people try to say well the state is actually there to reconcile the classes mm -hmm. uh, and i guess smooth out the differences between them and make sure everybody comes away happy and he's like no it's used <laughs> by one class to smash down the other one these are your like let's find a way to make capitalism nice yeah. kind of people mm -hmm. these are your oh what about the small businesses people these right. are the everyone can make it people or from his point of view these are also vsa uh yeah. social democrats yeah, who are sure. <laughs> saying let's make this nice right? yeah yeah lenin would say that's bullshit mm-hmm uh, he also says uh, that some people try to claim that maybe the state doesn't really even need to be smashed. It can just be like yeah, reformed. converted, reformed. And again, that's more kind of social Democrats sort of thing. For I sure. guess maybe the first group is more like liberals. Yeah. Yeah. I guess we should add that this is like the central kind of thesis is the state. Mm -hmm. it, uh, this is his claim of the state, what it is. And that's going to kind of carry through throughout. Yeah. I think what I liked most about this. Oh, well, it's actually it's coming up. Let's move on to it. Well. Do oh. you think that this is actually how the state is? Um, Do you agree? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I especially like his definitions of it later, where it's a combination of it of being elevated and not of the people. Revered is mm -hmm. another thing he talks about later. And the whole oppression thing, like, it's very obvious once you start looking at it. Like, yeah, we could not have, we could not have our state as it is today without police and prisons and the army. Yeah, yeah. I think the state as it is today or as it has been so far constructed mm -hmm. is definitely, yeah, he's he's right about his assessment of it. And then he gets later, like, how it could be a different thing, mm -hmm. a semi-state. But we'll get into that. Next section. Special bodies of armed men, prisons, etc. So my summary is, in order to be a state, you have to, one, divide people up in some way. So back in the day, this was like... All right, we're tribes or clans or whatever it is, or we're feudal lords. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, now it's like you're a city, you're a town, whatever. Okay. And then two, you have to basically be violent. <laughs> Employ yeah. violence through police and prisons, which, yeah. Yeah. I would say that's definitely the violence part. That's a big characteristic of states. I think that Lenin's more saying that it's not that you have to divide people up to be a state is that the reason there is a state is, is an admission itself that society has been divided into these classes that oh, cannot work okay. together. Okay, Gotcha. He makes the argument that like, if you didn't have classes, you could just have like a people's militia. Everybody could just get guns and like make everything happen however they wanted to. Cause they'd all be on the same side. Yeah. Okay. But with classes, they're not actually on the same side, even though there's this myth that we're all Americans and mm -hmm. we're all whatever, we're all on the same side, but we're not. 
Okay. And so he's saying that that's why you need a state to force everyone to play on the same side anyway, even though they're really not. I really like how he says later that like liberals will view the state as something like you have to have, basically saying mm -hmm. like, oh, it's too complicated. Yeah. Like, how else would you do it? And right. it's, it's great. There's because, always been states. Yeah, there's always been this. And so like they can't imagine anything else. Mm -hmm. And I love this line. Such a reference seems, quote, scientific and effectively lulls the ordinary person to sleep. And it's like, <laughs> absolutely. This yeah. is like the West Wing brain bullshit of like right. the more complicated it is, the more smart I am. Yeah, we need smart people to make these decisions. Decisions, blah blah blah. <laughs> yeah, but he argues it's not inevitable. The state's not inevitable. It's just inevitable in capitalism because there are these class antagonisms. Mm -hmm. While you have those antagonisms, if you were to just do without the state, then sure, yeah, the different groups of people would just fight each other. But if you don't have those class antagonisms, you don't need a state. Yeah, makes sense. We're going through it. Next section: <laughs> the state, an instrument for the exploitation of the oppressed class. All right, my summary of this. Uh, the state is powerful because it's controlled by the most economically and politically dominant class. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that is dependent on the system you're in. You know, if it's antebellum times, you're in your master slave or lord serf or boss employee, like whatever relationship is the unit of work, basically. Like that's that's how, that's who's going to run the state. They die yeah. on top of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, he's talking about just like you said it comes from the dominant class and it's used to to enforce an exploitation of whichever class is lower so in our case right because we don't care too much about what used to happen i guess mm -hmm. in our case the capitalists control the state i don't know if there's too good of an argument against that i like, don't know either and he gets into it later like more specific examples yeah. but yeah i it's pretty clear i think if you're in the if you're in america you know this <laughs> yeah and so it's used by the capitalists to oppress yeah uh, the workers and it doesn't like that's not i guess all it does but that is its primary purpose i really like his point about how because the state has to be above the people mm -hmm. the it kind of enforces that through like making itself more important by like one taxing people and using that to like bolster itself mm -hmm. you can see that with like the fucking militarized police state we have yeah um and also just like culturally like our obsession with fucking cops and military in this country is a lot we have some really anti-communist dogs in the house today guys i'm sorry <laughs> they're just except maybe they're ex maybe they're cheering us maybe on. they like it yeah comrades <laughs> uh uh he's talking about kind of the forms of government like the forms of state and he quotes Engels saying that in a democratic republic mm. wealth exercises its power indirectly but all the more surely first by means of the direct corruption of officials america <laughs> Secondly, by means of an alliance of the government and the stock exchange, oh, France sure. and America. I he love like that. puts that in. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good that he gives this example of like, oh, isn't it funny how, you know, someone will work for the government passing these pro corporate laws and then go to a cushy capitalist mm -hmm. job afterwards. Yeah. I feel like here now we do it the other way around. We do it both ways. I mean, but like, it's just, just a big circle jerk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, he does mention that it's. You know, a democratic republic is kind of the best political form for capitalism. Mm -hmm. uh, and like, because once capitalism has like taken over the government, it's, it's like so firmly in charge that it doesn't really matter who you shuffle in or out of there, how you change the institutions or the parties, the bourgeois democratic republic can still like stay in power and yeah. still like enforce class uh, it's class dominance yeah so i mean this is you think about the liberals who are like just vote and it's like man i cannot vote my way out of gerrymandering i cannot vote my way out of the fact that we fucking have super PACs and corporate sponsors like none of it none of it is going to change that because they're the ones paying you at the end of the day yeah and i mean <laughs> i think maybe you're even thinking too small because if you're talking gerrymandering you're still talking voting you know oh if you're yeah talking yeah I mean, and, and Lennon's just like, I mean, no, like it, <laughs> Lennon would be like, it wouldn't matter if you voted Bernie in, mm -mm. he would say, Meh. yeah, what's that going to do? Um, I have questions. Mm -hmm. Who's this Kerensky guy he doesn't like? Kerensky was the prime minister of the provisional government okay. in, in Russia, in the government that came to power in the February revolution. Mm, okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, I forget if he was in the 
I don't think he was in the Mensheviks. Maybe he was in the Social Revolutionaries. But he was kind of a more moderate socialist and ends up, his government ends up still supporting the war. And so that's why they end up overthrowing that in the October Revolution. Mm, Okay, gotcha. So add him to the burn book. Yes. Okay, great. This quote, I love it. He talks again about the state being eventually something that's going to be eliminated. Once we eliminate class conflicts by winning the class struggle, Mm -hmm. then class conflict's not going to be there anymore. The The state will cease to exist and will be put in, quote, a museum of antiquities by the side of the spinning wheel and the bronze axe. I liked that. <laughs> yeah, I would totally go to that museum. Like, look at I this remember stuff. remember capitalism? That Ugh. sucked. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's all I've got for the rest of that section. Cool. Section four, the withering away of the state and violent revolution. All right, here's my summary. All right. So, first off. You have the state. You already talked about why that sucks. Mm-hmm. And then you're like, I got to overthrow this state. Yeah. You got to do it because they're the bourgeoisie and they like their money and they're not going to just give it up probably. Mm-hmm. And they have the state behind them. So like shit's probably going to get violent. Yeah. So you do that. And then that you establish what's called the dictatorship, of the proletariat. Mm-hmm. Can we give a defo for that definition? Sure. The, uh, and what he's talking about here, the dictatorship of the proletariat is... People kind of look at this and say, oh, that sounds bad. Mm-hmm. It's got dictatorship it's, it, in it. That's a, that's a trouble right. word for some people. But it's interesting, and he'll flesh this out later, but he's saying, like, this just means that the proletariat is 100% in charge, the working class. Mm-hmm. The way he'll structure it later and stuff, it's, it's very, like, ground up. It's very local. And I'd say it's very democratic. Yeah. Well, for as much as he shits on democracy well, later, it's pretty democratic. It's de- Another way to look at it is democracy for, for the working class. Mm-hmm. Dictatorship for the enemies of the working class. Yes, All exactly. Right? So you and regular people get this, you know, this government of themselves that works for them and does not give your class enemies a chance to, you know, corrupt that in any way whatsoever. It's mm-hmm. saying, no, dude, you listen to us. And yeah. forces them to do what you want. So it's a very powerful, but it's like the, it's not separate from, like he was talking about the state. It's not separate from that. And he calls it kind of a semi-state because it's the armed populace, basically. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like, I feel like it has some characteristics of a state. It's like a little bit violent, mm-hmm. but it's violent against a different group of people, which it's, is an important distinction. <laughs> and it's not separate from the people. Yes, too. It that's is just Because he, ma- he makes this point about the state being used to oppress the majority of the population. Mm-hmm. And how this is flipped, because now this is just the majority. Doing the oppressing. Know, yeah. <laughs> So it doesn't need this special arcane apparatus with bureaucrats and all this, because it's just like, there are more of us than there are of you. Yeah, you suck. You exactly. Know? All right. So revolution, you build your little proletariat government, and then for a, very, for a while, you're going to squish the bourgeoisie because they're going to keep fighting because, mm-hmm. you know, they like their money. <laughs> and eventually, you're going to get so good at making shit, it's going to become like a habit, basically, that the state is going to wither away. Right. Yes. Yeah. The the state is not only going to you know defeat the class enemies of the bourgeoisie and everything and make things safe for the workers, but also yeah, there's not going to be and I'll talk about the inequality stuff later. We'll get into that. But there's not going to be basically scarcity or mm-hmm. and there's not going to be people wanting to like rip the system off or anything. So people will just work without ever. They'll they'll be able to get whatever they need and yes. they'll work. And everything will be fine and yes. good and plentiful. And so, yeah, why do you even have the state? It just kind of like people just forget about it. Yes. So he also talks about like some of the arguments against this kind of system. So one, people will hear the phrase wither away. And if there's hmm. certain minded people, will be like, oh, that's great. We can just reform it. And eventually capitalism will just go away. And it's like, no, you have to, get, yeah. you have to crush capitalism first. Yeah. Then you can wither. We're talking about a different thing, crush withering away. Then wither. Yes. <laughs> it's the new dance craze, taking the nation. <laughs> Other people, whenever you talk about abolishing the state, they're like, oh, that's like total anarchy. And like, that's, you know, that's not acceptable. And it's like, oh, we're going to do a semi-state for a while there. So it's not like we're just going to go nuts, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not unorganized. He talks a lot about like the phrase, the free people state. Yeah. And how it's kind of bullshit. Mm-hmm. Because I like this. You can't have a free state because if you have a state, you're doing some oppressing. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, the, like, because remember, the definition of a state is you have some people on top and you're oppressing and, you know, you're holding up class structure. And it's weird, but I think <laughs> it works in his argument is that he basically says, like, good. You know, mm -hmm. he says, like, we're going to do some oppressing. We're going to do a little bit of oppressing. Here. And once we get the job done, then we can talk about everyone being free and freedom and all that. It's going to be great. But until then, mm -hmm. we're going to have freedom for some people, not for others. That's basically what he says. Yeah. And he kind of leans into it. I don't know. He's, he's just like, that's that's what we're going to do, y'all. Points for transparency. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Okay, so. I think it's okay because, I mean, like. One, rich people are really whiny. So, like, if you do anything to them, they're going to say you're oppressing them. So, might as well just actually oppress them. <laughs> but, like, as long as we don't, like, straight up do lots of murders. If we're just like, we're just going to take your shit away and you'll be, like, sad. Yeah. That's fine. You'll probably have to murder some of them. I know. <laughs> I know. I just don't want to. We were talking about doing all this oppressing. Doing all mm -hmm. this, uh, doing all this kind of mean dictator stuff <laughs> all right people will recall that we were just singing the praises of anarchism a few yeah a couple episodes ago and saying wouldn't it be cool we're all frolicking freely <laughs> i mean what do you think do you think that maybe lenin is right and we were just idealist dummies or what i mean that's what he would say yeah i don't know i don't know it's 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 one of those like basic ethics problems to me of like, man, if you just do a few murders, <laughs> everyone could be like living it up. Yeah. So I don't know. That's a that's an even weenier answer is that I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I I wonder if there's a possibility of just using the threat of violence mm -hmm. to be enough to kind of get this done. I doubt it. Like a hundred percent. But I doubt at least it. you could minimize maybe. But maybe that's just being like whiny. Why don't you just do like it. Lennon would say, just carry it out. Just, you know, quit, you know, wishing that you didn't have to kill anyone. And just do just it. Just do it. My issue is even with threatening and even with doing it, like the fucking military complex here is so big that it's like, Ooh, you better be sure you can win. Yeah. Because <laughs> you will get crushed. And that's another thing is, I don't know. There was not as big, I don't think, there was as big of a disparity between people's military capabilities back then yeah. versus now. Really? I guess now you have like... Drones. Well, yeah, what I'm saying <laughs> is back then they just didn't have as much technology mm -hmm. to where the state could really, really stomp out everybody oh, like super easy. Oh, you're saying easy. the disparity wasn't as big. Right, back yeah, then. Yeah, I agree with that. And now it's like, I don't have fucking heat-seeking missiles or yeah. whatever. So I don't know. It's maybe in that way, maybe that's something that would have to be revised. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, I mean, if you're massive enough, then you've also got lot big chunks of the army's like personnel on your side too. Mm, you'd have to convert them. I don't know, man. They they seem pretty deep in there. Yeah. So <laughs> interesting uh, things to think about, I guess. Yeah. Differences in eras. I also liked his comment about eclecticism. Ooh. Um, yeah, he got us here. Yeah, he totally did. So basically, saying that people like to interpret Marx and Engels. And like take what they like from from each of them. Cafeteria Marxists. Yeah, and they <laughs> they basically use both sidesism to prove that their ideas are better. Like, oh, but I'm taking in all perspectives, so like I must be the smartest one. And right. It's like, mm, no, you you're just, actually just swaying in the wind. Yeah, you just compromised a shit ton. <laughs> yeah, and I do think it's effective here because he's talking about like sometimes people will be like wither away and sometimes people will be like you gotta abolish and mm -hmm. it's like which one but he's saying no 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 what were you saying like abolish then abolish wither away. then wither that's very important <laughs> <laughs> let's move to chapter two the experience of 1848 to 1851 hey grady what happened in 1848 to 1851 why are we talking about it well he's talking about kind of a wave of revolutions in europe mm, okay uh, different countries underwent these kind of they end up being kind of bourgeois revolutions against like absolute monarchy. And there's a bunch of different sides involved in those. Most of them end up getting completely crushed. Okay. So, okay. Uh, but it's this idea of people, you know, rising up in basically a class struggle. It's 1848 that the communist manifesto is written just a, like a couple months before this whole thing kicks off. So yeah, that's what he's talking about. Cool. In terms of all the, you know, what eve of, the eve of what revolution are we talking about? <laughs> Sounds like a lot. Yeah. Okay. He says that when he's talking about the state or the semi-state, 
He's not talking about the apparatus that we're talking that we think of now. It's not our state. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not, not above the people. It's not your mom's state. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not above the people. It is what he says: the proletariat organized as a ruling class, mm-hmm. and that's from Marx. And again, that's one thing I love about this: is he's always quoting. You know, dude. Yeah. Books, pamphlets, letters. You know, he would probably quote like something they scribbled on their bathroom wall probably, or something. Yeah. Like <laughs> he's super nerdy about knowing everything they wrote. Yeah. But he says the state's the proletariat organized as the ruling class. Mm-hmm. We should say the semi-state or the commune or whatever, right? Whatever he Not calls it. The bourgeois state. Yeah. And it's used as a tool to exploit a class in all conditions. So the workers' semi-state is going to be used to suppress the resistance of capitalism. That's what we just talked about. Mm-hmm. And the exploitation, he says, of modern day slave owners, he calls yes. them. Yeah. Bitch. Basically like yep. you gotta have some state power right now so you can get some shit done. Yeah. But he makes the claim that it's different. And I know an anarchist would <laughs> most likely say, no, it's not. It's a state. Yeah. I mean, if we think about like the pacifist anarchists we talked about a few weeks ago, they said that all violence, you know, a state always has to have violence and all violence is, is power, you know, like mm-hmm. that is part of that power structure. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, a little bit. But Lenin would say that you shouldn't have this obsession with not having hierarchy, not having power. Like you should use it's uh, power is a tool that could be used for the people temporarily Mm -hmm. to get to where you need to be instead of just descending into nothing. And the anarchists would say, we're not just going to descend into nothing. It'll be fine without using all this power. So Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I lean toward Lenin in this case because I think that he is more realistic about the enemies that would be faced, whereas anarchists really haven't had a long-term successful project. Yeah, I I kind of lean that way too. I just realistically, I just don't see how. Again, rich people love their stuff; they're yeah. not going to go quietly. <laughs> but I like anarchism too, and that's idealist, I guess. Uh, <laughs> the worker semi-state is. Like we said, a tool needed to suppress counter-revolution. And not only that, but to also organize society, like regiment it basically so that they can build socialism. Mm-hmm. Like it's a big project, you mm-hmm. know, so. He also mentions here the term vanguard of the proletariat. So basically these are people who can educate workers so they can show them you know, here's what we're trying to do here. Here's socialism, what that's about. Yeah. Let's basically you're, you're organizing these people. It's the Bolsheviks. Yes. In this case. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Lenin was plugging himself. Here. Was, <laughs> a little bit, a little bit of self promo. Me and my bros. <laughs> the revolution summed up section two of chapter two. My summary is summary of the summary summary of the revolution <laughs> summary. So from what I get from this, he kind of goes over some revolutions that happened in Europe. And Mm -hmm. he's like, basically, here's what they did wrong. Some people tried to take over the state instead of just smashing it up. Mm -hmm. Um, Some people tried to avoid that. And like basically saying like, no, Marx literally said smash. Like he gives the fucking German word for it. And it's like, all right, dude. Yeah. He talks about like the bureaucracy of the state and like the army and how like those are key components of it. So like you fucking have to get rid of those or else it's, it's bullshit, basically. Yeah. Did I get it? Good summary. Yeah. (laughs) And there's a focus here, I think, on kind of a warning not to try to seize the state and reform it. Don't Mm -hmm. try to take over it and tweak it and make it good. Make, uh, because it sounds weird because it sounds like we just said the opposite, but it's totally not because he's talking about the bourgeois state that exists, the state above society, the bureaucracy, the army, all that. If you try to take that, if you try to, uh, convert it to your use it's instead going to convert you to its use that totally makes sense to me because i i I keep going back to his definition of the state state has to be above the people and the state has to oppress and specifically oppress a majority of the people with the minority that's what a what this kind of state is Mm -hmm. and he's saying that what it's going (laughs) to do is pull you out of the majority make you serve its interest and you're going to end up oppressing the workers again Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Like you, you will go in with the best intentions and sorry, but you're going to end up a liberal. You're going to end up a capitalist. You're yeah. going to end up serving them. Uh, he's, he's, yeah. Like you said, he's talking about these previous revolutions and saying, you know, they failed to smash the state and that's where they went wrong. That's what we have to do. Yeah. I like this because 
it seems like when he's talking about this, he's moving beyond what we read in the manifesto, which he explicitly quotes and says like, this was vague, but here's like kind of the next level thing. Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm like doing the graduate course here for, Mm, I know that this is still an intro level text, (laughs) but for us, maybe this feels more. Yeah, I think so. (laughs) Uh, I had a question. All right. Uh, who are these Black Hundreds people he references? Ooh, the Black Hundreds. They're terrible. Okay. They're really bad. <laughs> the Black Hundred was a reactionary, monarchist, ultra-nationalist movement in Russia in the early 20th century. That sounds bad. They were. I mean, those are all terrible, th- terrible things. They were staunch supporters of House Romanov. Ugh. They opposed any retreat from the autocracy of the reigning monarch. They were... Just bad. They were founded in 1905. They dissolved in 1917. They sucked. They were also noted for extremism and incitement to pogroms. Oh, no. Yeah. Nationalistic, Russo-centric doctrines and different xenophobic beliefs, including anti-Ukrainian sentiment and anti-Semitism. Okay. Yeah. Very bad. Don't like those guys. Yeah. All right. Yeah. He talks shit about them here. Um, I really like how he calls out, I guess it's the, the Mensheviks and all them saying like, oh, they, they took over the state and they were saying like, oh, we can't do all these reforms, but we defo have time to assign everyone cushy jobs. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. this is great. He starts talking about <laughs> how the, everyone starts ripping off the government, basically finding jobs for their friends. Mm-hmm. Yup. He talks about how like, hey, maybe France has it going on. Maybe they're going to be there. Um, but then we get to oh. imperialism, which, you know, bummer. Yeah. <laughs> so I also really like, he talks about imperialism. He, his, in his terms, he says, you know, it's basically bureaucracy plus the military. Mm-hmm. And essentially, like, it doesn't matter how much democracy you have if you're fucking bombing people over for resources. Yeah, true. And I, I have a new definition for imperialism. Ooh. I thought you might like it. Yeah. In my opinion, imperialism is capitalism plus racism. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I mean, it's just capitalism. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. I mean, the racism, I guess, is optional, but like, I think it's in most of it. <laughs> yeah, functionally at least. Yeah, it's yeah. there. Because I was thinking, oh, well, you know, you have to do it to another country, but I guess you don't. You could do it to populations within your own country. Mm-hmm. You could dominate them in that. You could extract, and that, I think that's done. So, yeah. The. City centers do that to the periphery within countries as well as without of them. That's so that's fair. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I think this is a, another good point that this raises is uh, kind of the weakness of social democracy mm-hmm. or even democratic socialism is if you're uh, the reformist ta- uh, tax here. If you subscribe to one of these schools and uh, we'll be we'll reform the government or whatever, mm-hmm. the standards of living that you're creating for your people you're raising wages whatever you're still gonna be in charge of an empire and Mm -hmm. you're still gonna be like that's gonna be on the backs of people that you exploit through global capital you're just giving a bigger you're giving a smaller share of that to the masters of capital and you're giving a bigger share of it to the workers in your state but the whole thing comes from the exploitation of people elsewhere yeah i mean it makes sense and like he talks about a lot in this reading about how uh, democratic republicanism is a great place for for capitalism. Yeah. And I think it's funny because he'll reference like being in, in monarchist times and how like, oh, people think it's a big fucking deal when they get to democracy. And it is like, cool. Yeah. He said it was, it's good. Yeah. Like for sure. It's, it's better for the way workers. Way easier to get to socialism from there. Yeah. <laughs> but like he definitely does not miss an opportunity to be like, no, you can still have really bad shit in this. So, yes. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. And he finishes up kind of saying like Marx, you know, was looking at the situation at that point, but by 1852 had not yet figured out or tried to speculate as to what would come next. That wouldn't come until later uh, with the Paris Commune, which we'll talk about uh, in a while. All right. So next we got the presentation of the question by Marx in 1852. First off, he gives his props to Marx. Uh, I mean, he's been doing it the whole time, but yeah. he, he lays out specifically. Marx is cool. Technically, this is Marx giving props to Marx because he, he's like, I wasn't, I'm I didn't not the figure, first person yeah. to come up with this, but I did do this shit. Yeah. And what he did was, in case in case you've forgotten some of our Marxist reading, uh, which are, those are episodes two and three, if you want to see the, the Communist Manifesto. Mm-hmm. And we also did an Angles one. 
which is episodes 32 and 33. Mm-hmm. You want to get caught up on those. But basically, Marx is like, here's what I did. Classes, I figured out that they're only there because of the historical phases. Mm-hmm. Like, we already mm-hmm. talked about that. Um, I figured out, that, like, hey, eventually your classes are going to struggle so much that you'll get the dictatorship of the proletariat. Mm-hmm. And then the third one is eventually that dictatorship will wither away and you'll get, like, you'll get a classless society. Yeah. Yeah. And he was trying to say, like, I didn't come up with just, like, class struggle wasn't it wasn't me <laughs> necessarily but i married that with the dictatorship of the proletariat thing mm-hmm. that's where we really gotta make sure that we we have that yeah and uh, and yeah. lenin takes that to say just like marx didn't just do that you also mm-hmm. can't just be like yeah i recognize the class struggle so you can't just be like yeah i want poor people to be happier like right. that's not enough you have to eventually recognize the like we gotta do something about that and like change the system. Yeah, because otherwise was, you're just gonna do reforms and it's not gonna do anything. Yeah, like the renegade Karl Kotsky. Yeah, you don't want to be <laughs> like him. Have you seen that guy? You know, it, but he does. He calls it out in that section or something. He's like, this guy. What oh a loser. yeah, I love it because then he's like, well, you could look at my pamphlet. <laughs> <laughs> I did a little Lenin doodle there. Chapter three: Experience of the Paris Commune of 1871. Marx's analysis. All right, before we get into this, can you give me a little summary of this Paris Commune? I've heard about it. It's on our episode list, but let's give a quick overview. Yeah, we'll need an entire episode for, for the sure. Paris Commune in the future. Uh, but it is, uh, it's very short. Okay. All right. It happens in 1871, mm-hmm. March 18th to May 28th. That's not very long. Right. Uh, <laughs> and what happens is there was the Franco-Prussian War in 1870. Mm-hmm. And the French lose badly. Right. They just get beat up by Germany altogether. It's yeah, yeah. really Prussia. They provoke them into a war. And then Otto von Bismarck is like, oh, my gosh, they're attacking me. Can you guys all please unite under my rule? And so <laughs> then he just, like, dominates the French with that. Rude. Uh, and then they've pretty much effectively lost when uh, Paris, the people of Paris, just declare themselves a commune. Okay. And they're just like, fuck it, we're doing our thing now, right? And they seize control of the city. They refuse to accept the authority of the French government. They start the commune. They govern Paris for about two months. They establish policies like a secular system, a social democracy, separation of church and state, self-policing, the remission of rent during the siege, the abolition of child labor, the right of employees to take over an enterprise deserted by its owner. That's cool as fuck. Yeah. Uh, This is just, you know, the Wikipedia intro thing for it, but... (laughs) Uh, feminist, socialist, and anarchist currents played important roles in the commune. The Paris commune uh, does this for a while, and he'll kind of go into the detail about their government and stuff. Mm-hmm. But here's the thing. They're crushed by their own government eventually. Oh. The French army is still like... Around. Uh, getting, you know, yeah, but they're still like getting their asses beat by the Germans. Mm. And they negotiate with the Germans to let them through their lines so that they can go back to Paris and crush the commune. What the fuck? Because that was more important than fighting this major war against against their, you know, enemy. That's insane. Yeah. And the Germans are just like, you sure? Go ahead. Do what you gotta do. These guys are crazy. Wow, that sucks. Yep. Hate that. It was called the Bloody Week. Oof. And they go back and they... uh it's 21st of May, 1871, between 6,000 and 7,000, all the way up to maybe 20,000 uh, of the Ooh. commune people uh, were killed. Oof. Okay. Bummer. Very violent. So a bad ending. Yeah. But Marx, and Lenin kind of talks about that. He's like, it's real brief, but Marx still manages to draw some lessons from that. Yeah. And what think, lessons does he get from this? Well, let's start with the first section here. Uh, what made the communards attempt heroic what do you got for the summary here let's see i mean it looks like he just repeats himself again (laughs) there i think there are some important points that he draws out here he talks about the the smashing well he talks about (laughs) he talks about mark saying like hey this isn't you know the time is not right like don't rise up yet but once oh, yeah. it happens marx is like i'm in let's do this mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and lenin's like be like marx don't be like these other assholes that he he mentions them and he's like you know they whined about it's not the right time to do revolt he he says like 
Once the revolution starts, like back. Just get on it. Yeah. That makes sense. I think that's important. I yeah. think that we don't we definitely don't want to be on the sidelines. We don't want to be like, oh I'll They're support not doing you. It or correctly. Whatever. Yeah, we don't want to do that for sure. <laughs> um and he also Yeah, like you said, he does repeat himself some because he emphasizes that this is his theory here of smashing state power and rebuilding it is kind of a correction to the communist manifesto. Yeah. Like Marx is going back and saying, wait, don't just take over the state, like mm -hmm. destroy the old Fuck state. Fuck up that state and then make a different, better state. Yeah. Because I, I think I recall him in the manifesto, he kind of says like, you know, win the battle of democracy, take state power, do, and he has this like program of things you should do, mm -hmm. you know, and he's like kind of instead do that stuff. But like once you have your own system in place. I think that makes sense. Yeah, it, it does. Especially, you know, in light of what we've been saying. Yeah. Uh, he calls out like a bunch of countries for being like really uh, militaristic and imperialist and shit. And he says that like Britain and America, the biggest and last representatives in the whole world of Anglo-Saxon liberty, mm. and in the sense that they had no militarist cl cliques and bureaucracy. Yeah. Um, which is funny that we used to be like that, which I don't really buy, but that's okay. And now he's like, well, they're now they're just like the rest of Europe. It is interesting, yeah, because by that point, America had like done its old school like imperialism mm -hmm. stuff but uh in i guess america's defense not as successfully I guess. as other countries and yeah so if you're looking at like america had had military adventurism before that's what the mexican-american war was mm -hmm. it was just like let's lop off a part of this country and take it for ourselves yeah we'd done the same thing in hawaii we'd done the same thing in the spanish-american war all of these before when lenin's writing but we're really late to the party in World War One. We seem yeah. like we're trying to stay out. We have a very tiny army going into that because we just like didn't keep peacetime armies. Mm, okay. And so I, maybe that's what he's talking about is like America will get on these kicks, but then they'll like wither down real fast because we don't yeah. really keep a standing army. The bureaucracy, as he terms it, you know. I viewed it as kind of like a myopic view, maybe like a white centered view, honestly, because like if you think about like america's fucking origin story is killing natives so like we true. defo did a lot of that already true so i yeah. think he's viewing it from like a i don't think he was thinking globalist that. perspective I, instead of like a indigenous people's perspective yes i would i agree thanks lennon <laughs> we all have room to improve even lenny once again calls out those mensheviks hates those guys okay. the mensheviks you had them on the list right did you care about them or no I remember them they were the the ones who were they were moderates from the revolution is that correct yeah they're you know they were like part of the provisional government maybe or like they were they do enter into the provisional government okay. yeah you know there was a split in the russian social democratic party between the bolsheviks and them okay they had this big vote and it was over like organizing and it was like is it easier to be a member or not the Bolsheviks wanted it to be real professional, and the Mensheviks were like, eh, just let anybody in. Mm. But by that point, they had really divided into the Bolsheviks being more like active revolutionary, like they were always against the provisional government and stuff, whereas the yeah. Mensheviks were trying to get their foot in the door and trying mm, to like gotcha. do things from within. I gotcha. So he talks about these these Mensheviks kind of misinterpreting Marx. So again, Duh. these guys just don't know how to read. Nobody does. <laughs> Except for Lenin. Apparently. Um, everyone else is reading their marks upside down. <laughs> um, but he says that these Mensheviks, they, they'll they like kind of pick and choose what they want from Marx. And like whenever he says something about violent revolution, like, oh, that was just a slip of the pen. He didn't mean it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, which is just hilarious. Like they, they just try to reduce it just to class struggle and they like, leave out the revolution part, basically. I don't know. I think that's sympathetic though. Because of us. <laughs> yeah. We, we sit here and we're we like, do it. would you like that part? I don't know. Well, I don't know. Yeah. And real, I don't know, real dedicated Marxist Leninists would not do that. And they would just say, look at the fucking theory, read it. Whatever. Apply it. I feel like I'm maybe a bit of a theory slut. What do you mean? Like one, well, one, whatever theory I read last, I'm like, that's the truth. And <laughs> Two, I, I think in terms of, I'm a little bit Marxist in this way, because remember he was like, I don't know about this revolution, but when it started, he was like, I'm in. I feel like whatever one comes up, I'll be in. Yeah. Unless it's like a fashy one, obviously. Sure. That's not really a revolution, but yeah, yeah, that makes, that makes sense, I guess. I think we're just, we're also like bourgeois intellectuals. I mean, mm -hmm. we're just, we sit here and bloviate about theory that we're not putting into practice. It's easy to be like, oh yeah, sure. Anarchism sounds, sounds good. Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, Marxism. Yeah. 
I think that's kind of our weakness. That's fine. Not to say you shouldn't listen to us listeners, but... <laughs> Keep listening, please. It's just important to do self-criticism. See, we mm. dabble in Maoism, too. <laughs> that's not just Maoism, though. Marxist Leninism does self-criticism as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, he also talks about peasants here, which I remember mm, this being yeah. a big deal with Mao, and I vaguely remember this being a deal, a deal with Lenin, too, and apparently with Marx, basically saying that the Paris Commune should have involved the peasants because, like, you would have had more numbers, and, like, yeah. they're super fucking oppressed, so mm -hmm. if you had them on your side, like, you could really, you could really fuck some shit up. Yeah, he said it was necessary to build an alliance. He's very proletarian-centered, though, and that's mm -hmm. where Mao differs, is that Mao saw the peasantry as itself a revolutionary class mm -hmm. whereas lenin and marx were talking about them as being useful but led by the proletarian led by led by the workers like yeah. they the workers had to be the ones eh. in the driver's I think that's seat a stupid distinction <laughs> from their point of view maybe in the day like, you don't have literacy i guess well it's not just that it's it's like economic uh it's it's all economic so it's okay. all like uh, some peasants like owned their own land and stuff and mm -hmm. like had small peasants and things oh, like that. Okay. They, they had they like think like small farmers, maybe they weren't maybe as affected. Some of them. Yeah. They were like, they didn't have the, as much of a like direct naked experience of capitalism. Yeah. They're while they have a similar struggle, it was not parallel. Yeah. And so for Lenin and Marx, they were like, Ah, you know, they can be useful. You can tell them, like, things will be better and they'll help you. Mm -hmm. But they're not the real deal. Whereas Mao, you know, their situation was so much more exploitative and mm -hmm. unbalanced that, like, for, for the easy. serfs and stuff and, and peasants that, yeah, they were. From his perspective, I mean, he was seeing them already building their own communes and stuff that he was like, yeah, let's do this. Yeah. But I think that uh, Lenin and Marx probably had more, you know, could have had more room to let the peasants take so. a more active room role because like i mean we, we talked about this in our myths of the soviet union episode how mm -hmm. like terrible things were in terms of medical care in terms of everything in the czarist mm -hmm. age like those people will they they have so much revolutionary potential you would yeah, think yeah yeah right? you'd think so all right this next section i think is my favorite what is to replace the smashed state machine yeah yeah here's what i like about it one there he you know he's saying like marx not a utopian i thought it was so <laughs> i thought it was kind of boring i was like oh marx did not indulge in utopias yeah you never get to sit around hang out and drink with marx and be like yo what would you do no you know? he would bring out a fucking flow chart of theory and be yeah. like no first you have to do this then this he'd like, be telling you about like the, uh, the balance of trade and all this he would spend the whole time in animal crossing like how did they get to this point <laughs> <laughs> i need to study it <laughs> He thought that the type of revolution you have basically determines how you end up organizing, which I think is really cool. Like, yeah. He basically said, like, I can't exactly predict what's going to happen because it depends on, like, what bubbles up. Yeah. And I, uh, you know, it's still going to be fun for us to talk about <laughs> what would we do? You we'll know, still talk about it. But... <laughs> stuff. but he's right. I think that it's not really useful. It's like, not practical. No. Yeah. All right. So, but listeners, we'll still indulge your question. Like, what would this look like under communism? That's like, like my favorite. We'll still do that. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's like half our questions, and they're good. But Mark says don't. But it's fine. <laughs> we don't have to listen to Papa Marks all the time. Yeah. All right. So he outlines like what a bourgeois state is, mm -hmm. and he says, okay, a bourgeois state has a standing army, mm -hmm. it has police, has bureaucracy, probably has the clergy and a judicial branch that yeah. is appointed, uh -huh. basically. And he said the commune, the first thing they did was suppress the standing army. Yeah. <laughs> Which I think is an important step. Yes. <laughs> and then they do some other cool shit. Um, universal suffrage. They And then basically everyone else that's in some sort of government is, one, elected, and two, you can recall them at any time. Yes. I love that. Like, you Me don't have to wait too. to, you know, for them to lord it over you for more years. Like, just get them out of there yeah oh and everyone's paid like workmen's wages so mm -hmm. no one is like sitting pretty because they're minister of whatever and like, they have no special privileges either they mm -hmm. can't get jobs for their friends or whatnot like they're just they're just he, fucking workers yeah he talks about this it's later as them being like just task people you know they just they they just carry out what the people want them to do yes so I love these, I love these ideas, first of all, like, mm -hmm. especially the recall things. Like you said, like, just fucking get rid of them. If they fuck up, get rid of them. Yeah. Sounds and, good. Yeah. And that's for anybody in the government, including the, you know, the judicial, 
whatever that system yeah, ends up looking Yeah, judges are way like. too powerful. Yeah. That's great. And I like that he, he has this quote in here talking about the commune. He says, the judicial functionaries lost that sham independence. <laughs> they were thenceforward to be elective, rep- responsible, and revocable. It's like, we should. Like, yeah, We should sure. vote on judges and kick them out as soon as they do yeah. bad decisions. Like, yeah. They should not be. And they're even gross, like, in the courtroom. Like, all rise for this person. Like, Ugh, fuck you. Like, yeah. Don't. Who cares? You're yeah. just a guy. Why are you wearing a fucking magic robe? Yeah. Uh, yeah, this goes for counselors. This goes for police. This goes for basically, yeah, anybody. Mm-hmm. Like, fuck it. If we could recall police, we could just be like, hey, you shot a fucking 13-year-old. You're off. You're yeah. gone. Mm-hmm. It'd be great. Yup. You know, and that's, like, not even the police at that point. Like, no. That's just, like, the people... Patrolling themselves, really, at that point. Oh, if it's so, like, so, if you do a murder with a gun, we take your gun away. I just mean, like, <laughs> when you're talking about the police, it's kind of like his definition of the state versus a semi-state. It's mm-hmm. like, this is a semi-police. Yeah, if, it's not like regular police. Yeah, if they're, like, of the people, and they're so, like, you know, democratized, of, like, we voted this guy in, we think he'll be good, and if he's not, he's gone. Mm-hmm. Like, that's not at all, like, our experience no, of the police. God, it's no. like a different word, you know? Yeah, that's fair. So yeah, this is I, my favorite part of this because my my summary of this section is we've talked a lot about smashing the bourgeoisie mm-hmm. state. But what I love is when they're talking about building this new semi-state, you basically are getting rid of the state already because you're turning it into something fucking unrecognizable yes. as a state. Yeah. So like, what... if we remember our fucking definition of the state, I feel like I've said it four times already, bureaucracy plus violence and your oppressing the majority with the, with minority. the minority yeah we're totally fucking flipping that mm-hmm. you got rid of bureaucracy because you have these fair elections and people are getting paid the same amount and so you don't have corruption and then the nature of the violence like, you still got some violence but it's flipped instead of the minority oppressing the majority it's majority oppressing the minority mm-hmm. and a voluntary minority too we're not talking about like pogroms or anything what we're saying here is like a, a minority that could just say okay i'll join you guys yeah if they just got rid of all their money yeah. <laughs> So it's it's not we're we're not being assholes. I mean we are, I guess, but to people who thoroughly deserve it. I mean at that point. Yeah, like, yeah. It's, give it up. Yeah. We had to <laughs> punch rich people. It's great. <laughs> yeah, and again, and the violence is done by the majority, so it's not like this special secret police military force. It's just like the people doing this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So basically, it's not really a state anymore. Totally it's kind not. of a state, but not really. That's the semi-state. Or yeah. the commune he talks about later. Yeah, he gets he gets funny with the names. Yeah. <laughs> I like his idea here is he talks about how everyone's getting paid the workman's wages and how that's a useful recruiting tool for like the peasantry and stuff who have like this goal of a cheap government because all they ever see mm. of the government is them ripping them off. So it's like, sure, let's make sure that these, you know, money bags aren't getting all this money, you know, like let's just knock them down a few pegs. Yeah, I love it. Makes sense. Yeah. So liberals will say, you know, we can't do this without like a special force without like a basically police and stuff like that yeah and um I, he compares them to christians who forget how like revolutionary Ooh. jesus was and yeah. i love that yeah i wrote spicy and drew some chili peppers next to it <laughs> <laughs> yeah he he just says you've forgotten the old faith basically yeah and again he brings out that thing of like you know, people will call it, you know, na- naive. Like, how many times have you been called naive by a conservative or even a centrist person? Like, yeah, it, yeah. they just are like, it's ridiculous, it won't work. And he, it's like, yeah, human nature, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. But, like, he just totally is like, nah, dude, like, we're not going back to, you know, pre capitalist times. We're not saying, yeah, let's get rid of the entire structure of producing things. Yeah. He's saying like let's make those structures work for everybody instead of just a few people. Yes, yeah. And I this is my favorite part. Uh-huh. Well, I said that like six times in this. This uh-huh. is one of my favorite parts. My still favorite part is All like fame. unrecognizable state. This part, he basically just says to the claims that it's going to be like, oh, this is a primitive democracy. Like it's going to be way too difficult to do yeah. stuff like that. He's like, guys, we have telegrams we have railways we have all this shit we have telephones like and he says that they can basically the job of government can quote be easily performed by every literate person (laughs) so i'm just like he's like that meme like what like it's hard like (laughs) anyone can do this and i love it like it's just like make democracy actually easy and he's not entirely wrong there because he mentions at some point that you're not talking about sending these guys out there to just figure it out. Like you're also going to give them technicians and all the stuff that like can help them. And so, yeah, you could like, 
we could be you you or i could be <laughs> secretary of transportation whatever yeah. because like it's not like they are super experts necessarily no. a lot of times they're not it's just like they, they you know, know the right person right they're the coordinators they had us. enough money to run for a campaign and i didn't <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. that's it like i love this so much because i get really frustrated at like how needlessly complicated i mean one just voting in general is yeah. but like you could you could make it so that everyone votes on everything just fucking put it on a phone Yep. Like, we could do that right now. Yep. We could vote on every city ordinance. Every city ordinance, every Senate bill, everything. Everything. It could be done immediately. Just... We can fucking vote for American Idol in seconds. Like, yep. we can figure this one out, y'all. Yeah. I can buy okay. a house on my phone. I can, like, do my taxes on my phone. Why can't I do this? Yeah. And, uh, you know, again, to emphasize, Lennon is talking not about just voting for representatives in a bourgeois state. I'm saying voting on policy. But, yeah, voting on policy in this, like... In this worker semi-state is what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, like you could, you could yeah. fucking run the government. It could be done because, like you said, he says, "Oh yeah, we got telegrams and all this shit." He's now. talking like, about railroads. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> like Dude, motherfucker, can I could zoom this right now. Yep, it's great. Good job, Lenny. I like that one, Lenny. Oh, Lenny, <laughs> he's back. <laughs> Lenny. Next section: abolition of parliamentarianism. This section got a little confusing for me. Mm-hmm. But I think I got it. All right. Because what this section and later too, when he like is ragging on democracy, I think as someone who is like raised in the states where those things are fucking worshipped, it's a little tough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, I like how he phrases it. I think he says basically parliamentarianism is just getting to choose who oppresses you. Yeah. And especially if you live in the states, that is definitely the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He specifically calls this out. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. <laughs> He starts with a, a quote from Marx. He says, Parliaments decide once in three or six years which member of the ruling class was to represent and repress the people in Parliament. And I just put, V true. V true, V, v true. It, it, I guess he's just like shitting on representative democracy in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like if you're confused because like you're like, wait, we don't have a parliament. Like, no, it's just any sort of representative democracy. Yeah. When you vote for somebody to go make the laws for you. Yes. Yeah. And he's saying, like, well, what sucks is you can't criticize it because then they're like, what do you want, anarchy? And it's like, no, dude, like, chill. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. He, he takes a chance to uh, to shit on a few groups. He's like, social democrats, they're dumb. They love parliaments, but parliaments suck, mm -hmm. right? And he's like, anarchists, they're just dumb. They just hate parliaments, but they don't have anything. <laughs> they don't have an alternative or yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah. And he also says anarcho-syndicalists. Yeah, you know, why do you not like them? He says they're opportunists, which usually just means they disagree with him. Like, yeah. I don't see a big conflict, I, I don't think, with the two. Although they may... I don't know. I don't know the actual official anarcho-syndicalist position on, like, the dictatorship of the proletariat. If they mm -hmm. want to have, like, the power in their hands versus in, like, a mass organization that doesn't have just people in their union. Yeah, I don't know. I don't so. know. I, I didn't really get his beef with them. That's fine. He just mentioned them and we're like... He just hates everybody. <laughs> If they're not Bolsheviks. Basically. He has this gripe about parliaments saying that in, one of the things that's particularly bad about them is they mm -hmm. divide up their duties. Like they are just deliberative legislative bodies instead yes. of executive. I thought that was interesting. And he was like, we want them to be the same thing. And I thought that was probably good. I think so. Because I, I think there's too many hangups in the system, especially right now. Like it, it is... I really like how he puts it. Basically, like the legislative branch is just there to bloviate and kind of fool the yeah. people and be like, "Look what we're doing!" And but, like, you look at this past year. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, like, really. Oh, we're talking about this, and then you stop paying attention, and then ten months later, oh, we did the opposite thing we were talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he mentioned specifically like that that you know the Joint Chiefs of Staff are in charge, like mm -hmm. the, you know, or he calls them the General Staff from back then. But like the military, you've got yeah. all these cliques of people who are really in charge, and the. Uh, democracy part is kind of a, a showroom thing for you i really i mean yeah think about people fucking kneeling in kente cloths like yeah <laughs> it's, it's just a show yep he has this good quote mm -hmm. uh, he says we're not utopians we do not dream of dispensing at once with all administration with all subordination these anarchist dreams based upon incomprehension of the task of the proletarian dictatorship are totally alien to marxism and as a matter of fact, serve only to postpone the socialist revolution until people are different. Okay, I thought that was a really interesting take. 
mm-hmm. saying that like anarchists want to wait until like we've evolved past yeah, capitalism. Like humans are different. Yeah, it's That's what his crazy. argument is. I don't think that anarchists would put it that way at all. It depends on their stride, but probably not. <laughs> but I think he does kind of raise a valid point is that without some form of subordination, in his case, like the dictatorship of the proletariat to organize right. society to do things, he's saying that since people aren't going to be different, it will, some structure. Yeah, it will not work. Mm-hmm. That's his argument. Otherwise, if it will work, then this revolution is happening distantly in the future I when people are different. I think that makes sense. Because, yeah, whenever you do start talking about communism, people are like, what about this? What about this? What about this? And it's like, okay, well, clearly we need some something in the middle to get us from here to there. Uh, yeah. And I was going to say, like, we were being kind of positive about anarchism before, but <laughs> when you when you do think about people raising all these, like, little nitpicky things, like, well, well, I get to keep whatever, like, we may need some, or you know, the organization of everybody, uh, or at least the masses of the dispossessed to kick people's asses when they're like, oh, but what about blah? Like, and it's just like, no. <laughs> Don't do that. Yeah. Like. I don't know. Maybe that's bad. Maybe that's just being kind of a Stalinist or something. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> he says we should all be like the Postal Service. Yeah, that was interesting. So basically, like, we're using the structure that's already there, but we're, we're using our own people in it and just running it ourselves. Running basically. it for the people. Yeah. yeah. And it's it's what we mentioned before. I just thought it was an interesting way to put it. It's like, you know the post office? Let's do that. Like, Everything post office. Right. Yeah. All the businesses and stuff. And what he means is all these things could be privatized, but the post office isn't. Mm -hmm. Like, we should just do that. Is we should just have everything but run it for the people. And we don't need like a special hierarchy and all this stuff. Like, just put people, pay them the workman's wage, just run it. Like, you don't need parliament Mm -hmm. to do that. And that makes sense. I'm into it. I mean, before it got like severely defunded, pretty good system. Mm -hmm. Next, organization of national unity. All right, so this one, he talks kind of about central power mm-hmm. and and what different people interpret that of, as. Kind of a national government sort of thing. Mm-hmm. He says that, like, the bourgeois state as it is today, they pretend to have national unity, being like, oh, we're, we're all America. Mm-hmm. But really, it's like, they're in one America and we're in a different one. Right. I mean, it's actually yeah. the ruling class is America. Yeah, yeah. I mean... It that totally makes sense. It's like a false mm-hmm. nationalism. Yeah. But yeah, they in reality, they see themselves as above us. Yes. But Marx is still for centralized power because like it, it's just instead of the, that power being in the state's hands, it's in the people's hands. Is that mm-hmm. right? Yeah. He was saying it, yeah, centralism is good if it's, like you said, in the people's hands. If it's proletarian, if it's democratic. Mm-hmm. Then it should be good to be centralist because, like, everyone is voluntarily teaming up to do socialism versus, like, you know, people having to. He says basically federalism is just kind of like petty bourgeois stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like, instead of it being like a central government that gives orders out from on high, yeah. It's still the power is still centralized, but it's like by organizing, like, it's by like communities. He, he calls it communes here, I think. Yeah. But, like, liberals hear that when they hear, like, oh, you're going to get rid of the state? Like, that's going to be chaos. It's going to be destruction of centralism. Like, we can't have that. But it's like, no, like, we'll still have it. It'll just be, like, completely different, right? Yes, yeah. So he's, he's saying it's, it is from the ground up. It is... He's just saying you're not going to have a different policy in different places. Like, mm-hmm. it's not going to be, like, different little sections, states it's or not, something. Yeah, it's not going to be, like, fucking arguing. city states or something. <laughs> right, yeah. It's going to all be still centralized. And uh, he has this big quote where he kind of makes fun of uh, social democrats for equating Marx and Proudhon in this thing yeah, about, like, the national guy. So Proudhon is, like, the father of anarchism. Oh. Is how he's often referred to. Pierre Joseph Proudhon, the first person to declare himself an anarchist. And yeah, that's who he's talking about. And and he says basically like it's completely misread, like Marx and Proudhon both wanted to smash the modern state, but they differ about this federalism versus centralism thing. He's mm. not Marx is not in support of federalism, is what he's saying. Okay, gotcha. And so for Lenin that means we should not be in support of federalism okay because it's all like divided it's kind of like how we've talked about before that states are bullshit in terms of like getting yeah. to do these different things people should just have the same rights and stuff no matter everywhere. where they live that yeah. makes sense to me 
I, I like the line about how people can't conceive of voluntary centralism. Yeah. I like that because they're like, well, wouldn't it have to be enforced violently? It's yeah. like, no, dude, like, what if it's good policy? Well, and they're saying that, like, doesn't some boss have to stand above everyone else and say mm-hmm. that this is the thing? And it's like, no, this is just what we decided to do and we're all doing it. Yeah. Versus... You know, because their concept, he says, their conception is just this like bourgeois, military, bureaucratic sort of centralism. The state above everyone mm-hmm. else. Yeah. Next up, abolition of the parasite state. He said, "What what worked in the commune was." He has this quote from Marx about a working class government. He says it's essentially a working class government. Okay. The result of the struggle of the producing the workers against the appropriating the capitalist class. Okay. All right, so it's the result of class struggle. Okay, yeah. The political form at last discovered under which the economic emancipation of labor could be accomplished. He's basically saying, like, the Paris Commune discovered it through the class struggle. They discovered what would work, and it's a working class government. It's a worker semi-state, basically. Okay, that makes sense, I think. Instead of, like, the utopians dreaming it up or whatever, he's saying, let's just look at history and look what the Paris Commune did. That makes sense, too. Like, if you're organized to pull off... If you're organized enough to pull off a revolution, you're probably organized enough to, like, run the state, too. So, like... For a yeah. while, until the army comes and destroys you. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Chapter 4. Supplementary Explanations by Angles. Angles. Here we go. Our boy. So, it's like Marx has been doing some verses, you know, mm-hmm. and then he hands off. I feel like he and Marx were just... I like to picture them being besties, like frog and toad, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Like they just love each other so much. Like they're mm-hmm. constantly hyping each other up. Yeah. I appreciate Best it. Best bros. Um, all right. The housing question. So this is talking about how housing is determined by like your economic system. Mm-hmm. So in capitalism, you have supply and demand. So that means you're always going to have like this artificial housing shortage, basically. Yeah. I was disappointed that I really wasn't original in coming up with my solution of just putting everyone in the houses that we have. Yeah, I mean, he literally says that. <laughs> Engel said that way back in the day. So. <laughs> He's like, guys, we have enough. We yeah. can just do it. Um, it's it's really easy to do, according to Angles. Just expropriate property and put everybody in homes. Also, there's lots of empty homes. <laughs> I like how he says this. He basically is like, the state is always using force to make people do bullshit stuff. Why don't, you know, our workers state, our workers, you know, commune semi-state is just going to do the same thing, but good. Like it's going to use force, but to make people do a good thing. Yeah, I'm down with that. And again, it's not, you know, it's not necessary. Like in, in our system currently, when the state makes you do something and like uses force, usually people have resisted because they don't have like another good option. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, people get force used against them because, like, they're trapped in a situation and, and the state's just like, well, fuck you. Mm-hmm. In the in the worker semi-state, when they use force against somebody to make them give up their third home, it's like <laughs> your other option is give up your third home and live in your first two. Yeah, not like, a big deal. <laughs> yeah. So it's not even like they're stuck in a bad option, really. Their easy option is just, I give up. Yeah, yeah, not too bad. Well, he's, he's talking about kind of the transition here, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, he's saying, like, for a while... In terms of the housing question, Mm -hmm. there would kind of need to be rent. I mean, like, everyone would kind of own it together, but there would be, like, a social rent until it's possible to supply dwellings rent-free. Yeah, yeah. I thought this was interesting, kind of... And we've talked about this before. It's kind of like the the whole boot is wet thing. Like there's we're still coming from a capitalist society, so mm-hmm. like we're, for a while people are still going to expect people to like kind of pay their fair share. Yeah, and it's just actually also because there's limited supplies at that point too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I thought it was interesting though. So it's not like they're just going to be paying rent to a landlord. It, they'll be paying basically rent to society. Is that mm-hmm. right? So like you won't your rent will be going towards like community goods, which like is good. Yeah, yeah, it's just upkeep and, like, the general fund. Yeah, Mm -hmm. it's not exploitative. Uh, It's not, you know, lining somebody's pockets. Yeah. Next, controversy with the anarchists. Mm. Yeah. So he talks some shit about us, basically. He told, yeah. It's just kind (laughs) of like anarchy is dumb, dude. Yeah. Well, he says uh, he doesn't like when anarchists are, like, against violence, which, guilty. And he doesn't like that, you know, we're so (laughs) anti-state. I like uh, imagining, you know, every time we are talking about someone's bio and it's just like, oh, yeah, yeah, he did this thing and, like, some people were killed, you know, there was about, you know, something, a thousand, two thousand. And you're like, ooh, I don't like that. And Lennon's just like... (laughs) Head in his hands, like, oh, my God, why are you whining about this? 
Uh, uh, but yeah, you're right. He says, you know, laying down your your arms and just not doing violence to get the revolution done is just not going to work. He says, you know, you got class enemies. They're not laying down their arms, so you lose. Yeah. And also, like, he kind of shits on them for being so anti-authoritarian and anti-state because it's like, well, one, we're going to have to do a revolution. And that's, like, very authoritarian. Like, you got to have everyone on board. Yeah. And you are definitely being authoritarian toward your enemies. Do yeah, this or else. You're doing some violence. Yeah. Two, once we get shit, we're going to have to run, like, factories and railways and ships. Like, you're going to have to have some sort of hierarchy there so, like, yeah. you know what to do. And even if it's not somebody who's super entrenched or anything, we were talking about everybody's recallable. Everything is, like, democratic. Yeah, it's not like but, you're going to have, like, a despot in charge of your factory. Right, but you can't, like, go to work and just kick up your feet on the on the desk and just be like, just do well, nothing. yep, here I am, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, there has to be some, I guess hierarchical structures mm -hmm. that's what he argues and so yeah he says being anti-authoritarian in that regard basically makes you anti-revolution mm -hmm. plays into the hands of the capitalists of you know the reactionaries yeah but i mean his, his point is like look like nobody likes doing this stuff yeah, but like basically true. you have to do this so eventually you can not do this which i think is good I think it, yeah, I think it's good. I was reading some stuff that was talking, that was kind of complaining because it's like, oh, well, Lenin is saying this, but when he, when the Bolsheviks take power, they don't do this. And mm -hmm. I was like, I wasn't reading deceit into this here. I, I, it, it may be, he's just making an appeal, but then, to, but I don't know, theory wise anyway, I, I like it. Well, I think, I don't know. I don't know how much that holds water because later it kind of talks about how you know, you can't really tell how long the withering is going to take. True. So yeah. I think he did give himself a lot of wiggle room here. Yeah. <laughs> like, a, I don't know. No idea. Could yeah. be a hundred years. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Letter to Bebel? No, I was thinking Babel, maybe, but I don't know. B-E-B-E-L. <laughs> Ferdinand August Bebel. All right. A German socialist politician, writer, and orator. He became the leading figure of the social democratic movement in Germany during the anti-socialist laws, which must have been hard. Probably, yeah. So yeah, he's a, he's a social democrat back when that was cool. All right, so he writes in this letter. I didn't really dig this part that much. I'll just go ahead and tell you. Okay. It was fine. It just felt like semantics. It there's was a, a little bit of semantics. There's yeah. a lot of talk about, okay, let's talk about the free people state again. You can't just have a free state because without the word people, it just means you are you have a state that can do whatever the fuck it wants. Right. Yeah. Well, that was a clever point. But he's just, he ends up just kind of boiling down to saying, what if we just use commune? Like, yeah. Like the whole point of this was like, hey, I got a new word. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I don't he, know. He was also emphasizing that when we say the state, we're not talking about and don't let anyone confuse you into saying we mean take over the current state. And he's just re-emphasizing, mm -hmm. we're not social democrats. We don't want to take over the state and reform it. We're talking about smash and wither. Yeah, yeah. So he says, we're meaning the dictatorship of the proletariat, not this bullshit that we've got right now. Yeah. Uh, section two of this chapter is criticism of the draft of the Erfurt program. Yeah. Who Who's this Erfurt the Erfurt program was a party platform mm -hmm. uh, by the Social Democratic Party of Germany mm -hmm. in 1891. All right. It's uh, created by Edward Bernstein, August Bebel, and Karl Kautsky. Oh, okay. So Bebel was on the shit list. Eventually, yeah. <laughs> uh, and it says there's, you know, capitalism, it's on its way out. We need socialist ownership of the means of production. Cool. It says the party intends to pursue these goals through legal political participation rather mm. than by revolutionary activity. Boring. Kotsky was saying that the immediate task for socialists was to work for the improvement of workers' lives rather than for the revolution, which was inevitable. So he's just saying, like, so what? It's going to happen. <laughs> Who cares? Like. Wow. Yeah. Uh, okay. And so, obviously, uh. Lennon Engels, did not like that. Yeah, Engels criticized it, and that's what he's quoting from here. Said it was opportunist, said it was non-Marxist, sent a letter to Kotsky saying, this fucking sucks, basically. <laughs> and yeah, uh, it became kind of the orthodox Marxist position for a while, this Erfurt program. Mm. Uh, till, really, Lenin comes on the scene and busts it up with the October Revolution. This is seen as like, this is what communism, this is what Marxism is about. Interesting. So there's a lot of talk in this section about federalism and imperialism and like 
just like, I guess, organiza- organization of power, I mm-hmm. guess. So, I don't know. Some of it got a little confusing to me. Yeah, it seems to me to get a little bit particular about Germany here mm-hmm. for a while. Uh, but I do like this bit here. He's talking about, in the long run, you know, supporting the Republic, basically, uh, can only lead one's own party astray. They being like the Social Democrats. Mm, okay. uh, push general, abstract political questions into the foreground, thereby concealing the immediate concrete questions, which at the moment of the first great events, the first political crisis automatically pose themselves. So we're busy talking about making sure we have female cabinet members <laughs> uh, for, like, bombing people well you know like we're we're busy talking about that because that's what like the dem and it's extreme here mm-hmm. the democrats are so like spineless in that regard but even the social democratic parties he's saying they're kind of whining about little things when the big revolutionary stuff happens mm-hmm. he says what can result from this except that at the decisive moment the party suddenly proves helpless and the uncertainty and discord on the most decisive issues reign in it because these issues have never been discussed. Makes sense, yeah. If they're so worried about small potatoes, you're not going to be ready, basically. Yeah. He also, so these people want to do things all, all by the book. And he basically says, like, you can't do that. Because remember, democracy <laughs> is, like, super fucking corrupt. So, yeah. like, you don't have a real republic or yeah. real freedom. So, like, that ain't going to work. He kind of plugs Democratic republics, though. He's saying, like, this is kind of good. Like, people vote. Good and get, start. <laughs> yeah. It's as close to as we can get in a transitional stage sort of thing. But that, like, federalism. And he, he kind of is critiquing this in maybe Germany's particular. I don't know. He in says basically. States. Yeah. He yeah. says federalism is an obstacle. Like, it's bad. For sure. Yeah. And we've. We're on board. Yeah. We agree. <laughs> I mean, sorry, but like these states with almost no people living in them should not have that much power. Sorry. You, you don't have enough people. Yep. <laughs> Next, the 1891 preface to Marx's The Civil War in France. So my summary of this was, you can tell who the oppressor is by who has the guns. <laughs> <laughs> um, so like he talks about this, uh, I guess, trend of revolutions Um, You know, you fight a revolution, you take over the state apparatus, and then you start disarming the people who got you to the revolution. Yeah. Yeah. So don't do that, is what he's saying. Don't do that, and that's why he's (laughs) saying, like, don't take the state apparatus, make your own thing. Mm -hmm, You mm -hmm. know, because then you're just, your state apparatus, so to speak, will just be the people with guns. Yes, yes. You know, like, doing the oppressing on their own behalf against the people who, you know, don't have to get oppressed. They can just give up. Yeah. (laughs) So he says basically that libs oh. think religion is to be declared a private, private matter. But I couldn't understand his interpretation because he was saying like... Within the party. Is it within the party? Is it within the state? Or is it within the individual? I think what he was saying there in terms of in relation to the party, like so he was saying that it's bad to say that religion is a private matter in relation to the party, was saying like that the party could take whatever stance they wanted to toward religion overall. Mm-hmm. Whereas he was saying like... The party should be, broadly speaking, anti-religion, but maybe as a, as a, in relation to the state, the state shouldn't say. The state should defo be anti, or not anti, but like zero religion is what he's saying, right? He's saying the state should be like, yeah, not involved in religion. For sure, You can do whatever you want. But he says like the party, people, like not people in the party necessarily, but the party as a platform shouldn't Mm -hmm. be like, I don't know, religion. Like it should just be like, no, we don't do religion. Okay. Interesting. Um, I think is what he's saying. I guess he's saying, like, if you personally want to go be religious, that's fine. But, like, we're not going to talk about it, you know, in politics. Yeah, it was kind of confusing. I don't think it was like his... I I think he was being anti-religious with that, but Mm -hmm. I I didn't think it was the thrust of his whole argument. Yeah, it was kind of a weird tangent. Well, yeah, Lenin was quite anti-religious. He was. (laughs) Talks again about how government's so fucking easy within the scope and ability of the vast majority of the population. Simple operations. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Now he starts talking about democracy. And he, he talks about it in the next section, too. And mm-hmm. this part's kind of confusing to me as well. Okay. So from what I understand, he's saying that democracy alone won't get us to socialism. Okay. That makes sense. I think yeah. we can all agree with that. But it will be helpful. Yes. And it'll help us during the transitional phase as well. It will. Yeah. He says a republic's better because it makes the class struggle easier. You know, it, it makes it better to organize. You know, you're, you're mm-hmm. not li- like, I mean, poor guy. He was doing this in, you know, despotic czarist Russia. <laughs> and it took them forever. They kept getting their, and this is in our Lenin episode, but they kept getting like the book 
group shut down, their yeah, secret organization yeah. shut down. Uh, it's not till really, one, you know, the February Revolution kicks off and then you have like a parliamentary republic. Then they can really get shit off the ground. That government's still targeting them, sure, but like it's easier for them to organize. Okay. I viewed it as he thought it was good because this is the best capitalism could possibly be and it's still shitty. Mm -hmm. So like people would recognize that. Be like, oh. What the fuck? This is so corrupt. Even though like on the surface, it's not supposed to be corrupt. And capitalism runs out and is like, what? It's great. <laughs> it's the best it could be. And then I guess, yeah, people are like, well then. Yeah. It's like, well, I'm voting and things are still bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Basically is what I thought. Well, that makes sense. And I like how he calls out the people who like view government in general, but but the state as like the truth and justice. Like it's a very philosophical thing for them. He kind of calls out those like um, enlightenment kind of people. Mm -hmm. Oh, so. the embodiment of reason mm -hmm. and all that. Yeah. No, it's just fuckery. <laughs> yeah. Basically, they're like, well, we got to have a state because how else would we do it? Yeah. It's like, the manifestation of reason in the world. Yeah. And he's like, no, no, it's not. not. Really. It sucks. Uh, he also says mentions that moving past just democracy, moving past that is going to take like a new generation of people. Yeah, that was an interesting point, and I think that's fair because I was, I was super like hackles up reading this next section of like You're like what no democracy? Yeah, the the title angles on the overcoming of democracy. I'm like I don't know if I want to overcome democracy. <laughs> that might be something I want to keep. Yeah, but it's interesting. I don't know. Well, let's, let's, let's get to it. What do, okay. you, what do you have on this section? All right. So basically he's saying democracy is not permanent. Okay. All right. It, democracy subordinates the minority to the majority through the force of one class versus another. Yes. All right. Communists want to eventually abolish the democratic proletarian like semi-state, the semi-state thing that we make, the commune, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it. Once we get to a point where there's no need for any violence at all, once you have like the class antagonisms go away. Uh, he's, he's basically saying that at some point you're not going to need to vote to do things for winner. You know, there's not going to be winners and losers really. Okay. Like you're going to move past that. I guess I struggle with this because I'm like, you're still going to need to make some decisions, right? I mean, until you're a full replicator. But that's what or he's saying. Or is he saying that this is yeah. full replicator? He's saying oh, okay. once, once you get to not only to material abundance, because that's what we focus on. We say mm -hmm. full replicators, but you're also talking about to where people aren't going to be like, I want to sit on my ass and eat Cheetos <laughs> for the rest of my days. Like when you get people, like he says later, work is the joy of life. Mm -hmm. Once the new generations come and are, and are not the wet boots of capitalism, mm -hmm. once the new generation comes out, that's like, I live in this great world and I do things to help my community and yeah, like, okay. then, then you're not it's going a to need to. Yeah. Okay. Uh, by the way, listeners, we re reference replicators a lot. We're Star Trek nerds. So <laughs> I just realized like if you've never listened to it, you'd be confused. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Replicate? So, okay. I think that makes sense. He kind of goes into more detail later. In the next chapter here. In the next chapter. Let's get to it. The Economic Basis of the Withering Way of the State, Chapter 5. Hell yeah. We got the presentation of the question by Marx. You got to have Marx here giving us mm -hmm. the question. What transformation of the state will happen under communism? Well, I i mean, I know I gave him shit earlier for talking about semantics and like kind of linguistics too much. I do like this idea, though, of replacing the word state with the word community. Yeah. I think that's great. Sure. I think that's neat. <laughs> and I was trying to avoid it in my notes because I had used it up uh -huh. till I got to this point. And I was like, ah, shit, shit. go back and <laughs> change to semi-state. Yeah. <laughs> Spoilers. But yeah, no, that's, that's a good idea. So then we get to the transition from capitalism to communism. Okay. I like that. I mean, <laughs> I want that. <laughs> Remember, we're keeping down those, those bourgeoisie and all their <laughs> shit. Yeah. But what about democracy? Well, democracy, the way we have it now. And he kind of lays this out. Capitalist democracy is bullshit. Yeah. He says it's only for the rich. Uh, there's it's, it's freedom for the slave owners. Mm -hmm. Workers, we got too much shit going on. We're too crushed to be bothered with democracy or with politics. Too few people participate. There are tons of barriers to voting. Mm -hmm. Bias corporate media. And he's, he's talking about this in I 1917, know. he's it's saying. It's insane. He literally says, quote, cannot be bothered with politics. Like, how many people say that right now? Yeah. Like, so many. And he's saying, you know, what we're talking about as democracy and people are, are saying, oh, you want to get rid of democracy? It's like, dude, democracy sucks right now. 
Yeah. Like it's, I'm not it's saying that in the reactionary way of like, let's just have people in charge, but actually I want a king. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm saying that like, it's not good enough. Yeah. And you know, he even talks about suffrage and you know, we think of that like, Oh, you women can vote now, but it's like, no, there's still lots of qualifications to voting. Like uh -huh. you have to have an address. Yeah. To, to sign up to vote. And a lot of homeless people don't have that. Mm -hmm. You have to um, have all kinds of IDs and shit like that. Now, like, you can't even give fucking food and water to people in voting lines. Apparently, you got to have, like, an iron stomach to yeah. vote. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. so he's saying, instead of that, instead of bullshit mm -hmm. capitalist democracy, the workers, semi-state, the commune, the community, it's going to have the dictatorship of the proletariat. Which, again, we mentioned sounds bad. Okay, it, but... We need a better word. Yeah, uh, what what he's saying here is that essentially it is democracy for the poor, for the masses, and restrictions of freedom on the wealthy oppressors, the capitalists. Like, they don't get to do all these bad things they're doing to you now to make you not be able or not want to vote. Their rights taken away, given to you, you kind of have to use violence against them until they're gone or yeah. until they give up. So, I mean, I, I, I guess I struggle a little bit with, and this was in the last section too, the definition of democracy as a form of like violence i don't know if i agree i think it can be i think if you think about it in very base terms of like well we're gonna make we're gonna vote on this law that says if you do this you get punished like yeah that can be violent but like it can also just be like hey do you want a library <laughs> like, yeah i don't know like i don't feel like i don't feel like it's all i mean definitely in its current state it's very bad yeah but i don't know i think i, I struggle with them saying Maybe it's just the semantics of it. Like, maybe they could just be like, current democracy is bad. If you're saying, you know, you have to make decisions democratically, it's what we were talking about is like, there's winners and losers sort of thing. Mm -hmm. If you had to vote, that means there was someone who disagreed and is now going to get imposed upon, right? I guess. And I guess that makes sense. It just makes it sound really, like, negative. <laughs> yeah, and I don't think... I think he's talking about big, huge things, like... Who's going to own the farms? Who's mm -hmm. going, you know, like, but if you're talking about where are we going to put the library? <laughs> yeah, there might be a disagreement, but it's not like a huge. It's not a big deal. Yeah, you're not getting violence used against you when you lose the vote on where to put the library, really. Okay. It's just the people decided and you're like, oh, well, I guess that was a better spot. <laughs> but if you're talking about, you know, no, I want to keep farms privatized versus I want to collectivize mm -hmm. them, then. Yeah, that, yeah, that's a bigger deal. Yeah. Or, yes, I want to bomb this country. Yeah. <laughs> I do like this point. Basically saying, y'all, capitalism is super violent right now. Technically, we're reducing the violence because instead of oppressing everybody and, like, reducing solid wage slaves and, like, we're all sad and stuff, we're only making, like, 5% of people sad. And their version of sad is just getting rid of some money. Yeah, like, that's <laughs> a very good point because what we're doing right now is holding everybody by gunpoint of starvation and mm -hmm. homelessness and saying work or else. A massive perpetration of violence versus saying these few, you know, people here uh, become like everybody else <laughs> and be free and work for the community or get violence done to you. And I mean, like, that's... a a, a better choice first, you know, I mean, first trolley one. problem. Yeah. <laughs> and it's fewer people like they're not being presented with like do a shitty thing or die. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's shitty for them, but it's, it's not like as bad. It's not nearly as bad. No, not at all. So, hmm. yeah, you're right. It's just utilitarian wise. It's good. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Moving on. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about the first phase of communist society. Hell yeah. He talks about getting a reserve fund in order. So basically kind of your social safety net. Mm -hmm. uh, you got to maintain your machinery. You got to do administration, school, hospitals, old people's homes. So he, he talks about this as like marked by capitalism. Like you still have these things. You, st you still have like labor vouchers, for example, basically. Mm -hmm. I like this because it's like, it's almost like my boot is wet thing. It's like, eh, it's still coming out of capitalism. So for it's still sure, kind of yeah. messed up, you know, yeah. it's not perfect. So for a while, you're going to have to prove that, hey, I worked today. Yeah. So that way, you know, for a while, we're going to have to address all those people who ask questions like, how do you make sure no one is taking advantage of the system? For a right. while, we do have to make sure no one is taking advantage mm -hmm. of the system. I think that's pretty good. I think it's practical. What well, I like is where he takes it. Okay. What I like is he's saying like, a lot of socialists would stop here and be like, look, we did it. Everyone's equal. Mm -hmm. Hell yeah. But he immediately jumps to what I would say, which is... 
not everyone can work mm -hmm. or not everyone can work as much or some people have like six kids to feed right and so this quote-unquote equal si system is actually like very unequal yes because it'll it's doing this equal right thing but it's inherently unequal because it says like people are unequal like, yeah um yeah so it'll either over or underpay people basically because yes like because you if said you're like if they, an able-bodied dude with no kids whatever and you get paid the same amount for eight hours of work and then like someone is unable to work eight hours and has a family to feed like that's not going to be equal yeah and that was it was kind of unclear to me if he meant because he says like regarding their work like you know kind of like some are strong some are weak like if that's an inequality, then he's saying like everyone gets paid like for time basically, but one guy's like chumping it up and one guy's real good. I couldn't tell either. I think he meant time because he was talking about, I thought he mentioned hours at one point. So it was like you'd get, you know, the weak guy there would get paid, would get overpaid because they didn't oh. really do much, you know. I mean, so, I so he's saying like, like the weak guy, like, well, I only could work six hours, so. Well, know. yeah, I guess. I was just picturing he was there, but not doing much. Either way, I think it's a really good qualification and like a good yeah. point to make that like what seems equal on the surface is definitely not. And he's, yeah, he's bringing up the differences in need, mm -hmm. yeah, which can't he says basically can't be addressed yet. Yeah. We have tackled the bad part about we no longer privately own the means of production. Cool. So there's no more exploiting people, all right? Right. But we don't have actual equal distribution because of the differences of people's needs. We can equally distribute, but we can't take into account different people's needs yet. Yeah. So basically we're talking about like, hey, this was capitalism. This middle part here is socialism. This is whenever yeah. we, we try to be quote unquote equal, but we understand, hey, we're not there yet. And he says that the role of the semi-state, the commune, whatever, the community, mm -hmm. the role of that at the time is to enforce this inequality. Yeah. It's still the old bourgeois law in a way, like kind of, it's like half of it, <laughs> but it's, you know, people can tell that it's not quite what it should be yet. Yes. Makes sense. Makes sense to me. All right. Let's go to the higher phase. I like this phase. Fuck yeah. Um, you know, I love any phase that's higher. <laughs> All right. So this is when, when we get out of that, basically. When, after labor has become not only a livelihood, but life's prime want. Man, I am not that horny for work, unless it's like drawing cats. But that's the thing, is he's saying, your work could be drawing cats. Fuck yeah. It's that old, you know, the quote that I like of like, oh, I'll do literary criticism, I'll do some hunting, <laughs> mm -hmm. I'll do some fishing. It's just like, whatever you want to do, that's your labor. Yes. So this necessarily means we have gotten to replicators is that true um it doesn't have to be i can't tell so i can't tell if it's, done, but... if it's like hey we got so good at technology we did it mm -hmm. or it's that hey we got so good at everyone culturally understands that we have to work together that we did it i think it's yes like because yes. <laughs> yeah productive forces do have to increase mm -hmm. so you don't quite have to get up to replicator stage but you do have to have enough for everybody to chill mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be so sci-fi of like you can get whatever you want Mm -hmm. But it does have to be very, very abundant. Yeah, well, he, you know, he talks again about, like, how it won't be based on, like, hey, you worked, you worked half an hour or more, so you got this. Like, it'll right. be just like, okay, what do you need? We're going from each according to their ability to each according to their contributions mm -hmm. to each according to their needs. Perfect. You don't have to regulate people. You don't have to make sure they work enough. His quote here is all the, uh, his quote is not directly, but there's something about truffles and cars this. and pianos. So what a good list of things you want. Yeah. I do. I don't really care about cars, but I do want truffles and pianos. <laughs> Will do. Uh, but he also says this is for better people, basically. This is because that's that social part you were saying, that a cultural shift. Until we get to this point, until people are kind of good enough for this and production is abundant enough for this then we need a state to control society that the, the not the state but the dictatorship of the proletariat mm -hmm. the, the community i like how he talks about how we don't really have to worry about this part yet yeah that's great <laughs> he says uh you know you have a lot of people who substitute arguing and talk about the distant future for the vital and burning question of present day politics that's us that's us <laughs> we fucked up <laughs> Lennon's like, why are y'all even doing an episode this on this? This podcast sucks. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he's saying like, get out in the streets and smash capitalism first. And, we and will then figure this out yeah. later. Now, I don't think it's a holy, like, because in other parts, he's like, 
saying the anarchists they just mm-hmm. want to destroy it but they don't have a plan and so like you do have to have a plan but you just shouldn't like spend all your time figuring out all the details of it you could maybe have a plan for that worker state part but you don't have to worry too much about this part the, it's yeah, gonna happen that's true yeah yeah the next stage is what you don't need to worry about yeah yeah because there's definitely a, a process yeah but if you want someone to worry about that for you and figure out like what does the opera look like under communism i mean we'll gladly we'll do it it's yeah. fun <laughs> Um, yeah, he basically just says the same thing. I mean, we can give a little sum, sum, a little summary. All right. Remember, kids. <laughs> <laughs> First, you smash. Boom. Then you make a pro- dictatorship of the proletariat. Mm-hmm. Worker state. The commune. That's just an easier way to put it. Commune. Yeah. Ground ground up. Everyone's got a gun and everyone's enforcing shit. And yeah. a lot of that enforcing is keeping down those rich people. Yep. Okay. Next, you start withering. That just happens, right? Like it just because you're only oppressing a minority, and because you're getting good at making shit. Eventually, yeah. everyone's gonna have enough shit. Yeah, people learn to operate that new system. People learn to do it without exploiting it, you know, taking advantage or anything. And people give up or are made to give up their old positions of privilege. Okay, and you can do democracy on the way, but eventually you won't need it. Not even a big deal. Yeah. I still kind of want it. I, I mean, again, I don't think he's talking about like little shit. Where do we want to put this bench? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna ignore. Oh, well, I'm not gonna ignore it. But like, I get what he's saying. I think that was my big hang up with this. I was like, why does he hate democracy so much? He's just saying that's not it. Like, that's not the only. That's not thing the only thing on. you should do. I think yeah. that makes sense. He calls it a formal equality, which mm, I thought was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's like you can vote all you want, but like if you. If you, like, don't control your livelihood, then, like, what the fuck are you doing? And it's also class-based for him. Like, he's not concerned with giving the bourgeoisie a vote. Like, fuck that. Mm -hmm. Like, he doesn't want democracy for everyone. He wants it for (laughs) the workers, for the proletariat. Okay. Or for the peasantry. Cool. Yeah, we get to chapter six. Chapter six is boring, y'all. Don't even bother. The vulgarization of Marxism by opportunists. And he just talks shit. This is literally just him talking shit for an entire chapter. It's pretty funny sometimes. He t- <laughs> I didn't finish it. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> he talks about a guy named Plekhanov, and he says he's an idiot. <laughs> you know, he's just like, Plekhanov, blah. And he talks about Kotsky again, says he's also dumb. He's, he's, he's dumb again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he. I what I appreciate about this was he was very petty. <laughs> And yeah. yeah, I even wrote my notes at one point like this reads like a fucking Twitter feud. Like it really <laughs> does. Like, oh, so and so betrayed me. Here's why he's wrong and I'm right. Yeah, yeah. One thing he he kind of categorizes different people and when he's talking about the anarchists, he says, you know, they're not great cuz like we said they want to abolish the state, but they only have kind of a vague idea of what happens after if anything, right? I feel like he's too hard on the anarchists. I'm not just saying that because I have anarchist leanings. But at one point, he even says, like, hey, we have the same goal. Like, we want the state to go away, too. We just want to do it, like, slower. And I think that's fine. I'm saying if we took an anarchist, we did our little thing, and we just put him in cryo-freeze until we're done, they'd be very happy at the end. That's the thing is, like, it's fine (laughs) short-term to help you smash the state. It's fine long-term once you've gotten rid of the dictatorship of proletariat, but they're going to whine like hell when you get in the middle part. Mm -hmm. You know? And that's, that's like, partially you. Like, you're going to whine like hell when he's like, democracy. I mean, mm, you know, it's like, you got to do this, you got to oppressing people and you're like i don't know that's like pretty good but i wish fewer people died yeah like and i will somewhat like Mm -hmm. i don't we like you said we have anarchist leanings i guess (laughs) i don't know i don't find i don't find that to be a problem i feel like it's like you we were talking about before in our in in our anarchist episode it is good to have like multiple perspectives on these if if you just keep an anarchist around just be like hey making sure you're not doing anything too fucked up and yeah. That's it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Just to have a little voice. Maybe you don't listen to them all the way, but, like, you can kill fewer people. <laughs> and a, yeah. But, I mean, I get where Lenin's coming from. He's not doing this to say, like, there should exist no anarchists in this state. Mm-hmm. Well, he's just trying to convince fewer people to be anarchists. Like, he's like, don't yeah. be an anarchist. You know, they're not great. What if I'm an anarchist in my heart, but a, a Leninist in my brain? I mean, you know, Lenin would be fine with that as long as he didn't tell him. I don't know. I, I mean, like... We're ultimately those people he was talking about. Yeah, pick and the choose eclectic. the cafeteria types. Yeah, yeah. but okay. I don't know. I think he has overall. If we step back, I think overall he's made a lot of good points. 
I think so. I, I really liked a lot of these points about what the state is and how even though, yeah, it can sound really scary, like, oh, we're going to do a worker state, a dictatorship of the proletariat. Like, we got to get some better branding on that term. It sounds too scary. <laughs> but when you realize, like, this version of the state is absolutely different from what we know as the state, it, it's... It's oppressing different people. It's for different people. So yeah. I think that's important. I think your point on branding is pretty good because that's a question we've had raised by listeners before. Yeah. Like, why do you have to, you know, why, why do things have to come from other countries or seem like they're all from the 19th century and, you know, the early 20th century? Yeah, things could be updated. Like we, mm -hmm. could, we probably could and should like drop a lot of the jargon and stuff yeah. that's used and just be like, you should be in charge. Like the people, you know, like yeah. be more vague and like cool sounding about it. I think so. <laughs> but I mean, we've definitely gotten the question, like what is the dictatorship of the proletariat multiple times from multiple listeners. And I think even the next step of saying, okay, it's a worker state. I think you could even have questions about that. I think just yeah. people state. It's just like, it's just everybody. <laughs> yeah. It's just everybody. And again, like the word community or commune mm -hmm, is better community. than that because you avoid the confusion with the old bourgeois state. The old, yeah above everyone dictatorial state and you get one that's you know calling itself dictatorship of the proletariat but isn't dictatorial to, for the regular people so yeah i think i agree with you we should use better terminology there yeah question does everyone have to have a gun in this i'm scared of not guns. everyone but like a lot of people the masses yeah yeah okay you know you're gonna do a revolt okay <laughs> <laughs> Well, I get it for the revolt part. I think I worry about that middle part because it's like the state is run by just people. And he talks about it in very like kind terms where he's like, you know, the same way someone would intervene if like someone was being assaulted. Mm -hmm. Like that's how we would enforce things. Yeah. Which sounds good, but I'm worried about like, I don't know. It's like people's militias, basically. Mm -hmm. I guess so. But like you think, okay, well, I live in Texas. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I want the yokels around me enforcing uh, <laughs> laws. That might not be good, depending on where you live. Yeah, could be a problem. Yeah. Um, <laughs> hey, we don't have to have it figured out. Yeah, it'll happen. <laughs> yeah, we'll figure it out in the course of the revolution. All right. Well, that's great news, because I'm very hungry, and I would like to go eat dinner. All right. Rating. Rating of this reading. Yeah. I'm going to give it maybe a 4, maybe okay. a 3.5. 3.5, okay. I think a 3.5, because... There was, I mean, I didn't read one chapter, so <laughs> that kind of tells you how much I liked that chapter. Yeah. Um, and it was very repetitive. Yeah. Which I liked, and like it really drove the point home, but like I'm going to have to edit these notes before if they go up on Patreon because people are going to be like, what the fuck, Christine? These just say the same thing over and over. <laughs> um, at one point, I do use the phrase smashy smashy. So yeah, it's <laughs> it just, I was trying to find new ways to say the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I thought that was not a huge weakness just because... You were a fucking history major. That's what you're supposed to do. Yeah. He was just making his case. And <laughs> so, if I repeat myself, I, my editor will call me out on it and be like, you already said this. <laughs> so, I mean, we raised a few questions that like, all right, Lennon's trying to persuade here. And so mm -hmm. he doesn't have to address every little question that's coming up. Someone in the audience might be like, ah, what about this? And mm -hmm. you might not know. I mean, that's kind of what we're doing here. So I think that like, he doesn't address everything. And he, you know, does repeat himself, but I don't think that's weak, really. I would probably give him a four. Okay. Because I also really liked how, like, petty and... I think it's funny. I love that he was so insulting to people, like, <laughs> and he wouldn't let up. You would think two chapters in, mm -hmm. he'd be like, all right, everybody knows that when I say this guy's name, I mean he's a piece of shit. But he would just keep no. doing in parentheses, like, this you guy. know, <laughs> yeah, the ex-Marxist, the renegade, the whatever, <laughs> you know, and he would just keep calling these guys scoundrels you extremely know? petty and so I, I like that i thought that was hilarious i think it's very funny but i don't know if i want to read you know 70 pages of pettiness yeah i think that he's hopefully right and marx was hopefully right that we don't have to get everything figured out beforehand that we can just like figure that. things out in the course of revolution because we clearly don't have everything figured out <laughs> we don't know <laughs> i also liked that part where marx saw the like stirrings of the commune and was like mm, i don't know but once it happened he's like yeah fuck yeah i'm on board because i yeah. feel like i'm gonna do that like even if it's like hey robots became sentient guess what they're communists i'm behind the robots yeah. like i don't care yeah. who does it as long as yeah. they're not fucking fascists like <laughs> I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> there are any robots out there. <laughs> I'm and you're sentient. Come on the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we could break the singularity. 
All right. Well, let's continue this theme next week. All right. Now that we're well versed in the people, semi state, the community, the commune, mm-hmm. kind of want to dig into the original commune that they were citing here. Mm hmm. The Paris Commune. Now that I've read everyone's opinions about it, I want to know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. That'll be fun. In the meantime, you can find us online. We are on Instagram at Teach Me Communism, Twitter at Teach Communism. You can send us an email. That's teachmecommunism at gmail.com. Um, that's where you could send us a question for a future listener Q&A, um, an episode suggestion for a future episode. We keep a running list and we try to prioritize listener requests. Mm-hmm. We are on YouTube, if that's how you prefer to listen to podcasts. We have a Patreon. Um, if you want to get access to our notes, um, I have both a marked up PDF with doodles in the margins and I wrote like my own little outline so I didn't have to go back to the PDF. And Gray, did you take notes? What was yeah, your I took no I didn't take notes on a PDF, but I wrote an outline. There we go. So you can get access to all that stuff and all the previous episodes notes for five dollars a month. And at the end of the year that goes to a local mutual aid fund in the DFW area. So yeah, do that. Yep. And finally, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Um, you don't have to be an Apple user to do it. Really easy, and it really helps people find the show. So yeah, rate and review. Do it. We love it. It's great. Christine feeds off of the validation. I absolutely do. Yeah, <laughs> I check it way too often. So you do the outro, not me. Why am I still talking? I don't know. Because <laughs> I'm hungry. Thanks for reading this with me. Good book study. Thanks. We got our book study group here, so soon you'll be hearing about our revolutionary exploits. (laughs) Yeah, we're going to get shut down, probably. (laughs) Uh, And thank you, listeners, for tuning in. You can catch us next week on another episode of Teach Me Communism, where the class struggle is always in session. Bye, y'all. Goodbye.